our Father and our God, again we stand in your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for the privilege, the opportunity that's ours to worship you and to study your word. It's my prayer that the Holy Spirit would just take this time and just seal truth to our hearts, filtering out and stripping away any error, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve again here at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the Epistle to Titus, verse by verse, and in our last study together, we ended chapter 2. I uh, spent a bit of time in the 14th verse, and so I'd like to, at least since we're crossing over into the third chapter, I'd like to set the scene uh, for those who may have just stepped into this series of, of studies for the first time. It is by far more than coincidence and more than interesting to me that in every case where the Holy Spirit deals with our Christian responsibility, which we're getting ready to look at, it is always introduced and it's always closed by a presentation of the finished work of Jesus Christ. As we begin this third chapter, we're going to look at some exhortations, and we'll look at those in just a moment, but we've been pointed by the Holy Spirit to the authority of the Word of God and the accuracy of Scripture, the reliability of God's Word, and the importance of God's Word. And we reach the end of chapter 2, where we see the finished work of Jesus Christ redeeming us who gave himself for us. And this is an important point that I want you to take note of. We see a sovereign God, a supremely sovereign God who is in control of every aspect of our lives from beginning to end. We see this revealed to us in the revelation of him having died in our place. The word there, the, who gave himself for us, the word is huper in the Greek, in our place. It, it's not that he laid down some, uh, some money that we may or may not take to pay our sin debt. He gave himself in our place. And he did that in order that. He might redeem us. And the very word redeemed is a word that I've spent some time on the past several years. There are three words uh, translated redeem. He bought us. He bought us to remove us from the area of commerce. We're not to be resold again, ever. And he set us free. So he redeemed us. He bought us. He took us out of marketability and he set us free from all iniquity. So it's inconceivable to me how that Christians by the millions say, well, I know that he died in order that I might be redeemed from all iniquity, but it hasn't really worked with me. You know, if you just knew what I did, and folks, I don't want to know what you've done. Don't confess your sins to me. It won't do you any good unless you've sinned against me. You have the Word of God that says that you are redeemed. Not that you could be, not that you might be, not that you ought to be. You know, if you just wanted it to be, you'd be redeemed. The natural man has no desire to be redeemed. If Jesus Christ died in your place, you are redeemed. And to purify unto himself. So you are purified. Therefore, as by the disobedience of the one, the many were made sinners, even so by the obedience of the one, the many were made righteous. And the reason both the alls and the many in the Greek are articulated is so that you might understand 
that they're the same group of people, the same ones who were made sinners were made righteous. They weren't made righteous by their activity. They weren't made righteous by their decision, by their acceptance or anything else. They were made righteous by the finished work of Jesus Christ. He purified. He made righteous a people of his own choosing. Yet the popular thought today is that it's a, of our choosing. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. Of course, that's only true if you choose Christ, they say. And I don't know what they do with that ordained part. What a marvelous truth that seems to so bother people because they are unwilling to let go of some scrap of their own human logic. He purified unto himself a people of his own choice. You're looking at God's sovereignty. You have it translated a peculiar people in the authorized, ver authorized version. I pointed out uh, this, this is a unique phrase. It means a, a precious, special people of his own choosing. And then we have the word zealous. Actually, it's a noun, not a verb. Zealots is what the text literally states. Zealots of good works. And I stated in my previous video that it is my personal opinion that the good works involved in this context are the finished work of Jesus Christ. The good work that you'll do be, you know, will be down in verse 1 of chapter 3 or beginning at chapter 3, uh, verse 1. And this, I'll also suggest, the works that we are about to look at can't be separated from his finished work. Because they are built upon that finished work. Many will disagree with that. And the wonderful part of all this here is that you don't have to agree with me. And if you hold that thought in mind, I believe that that precisely relates to the words not letting anyone despise thee, which I'll, I'll come back to here in a few minutes. It is my opinion in this context that the good works here represent the finished work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that should be the area of our concentration because God calls us zealots of His good works. Now whether we're uh, zealous or not I believe this is the reason why the Lord the Holy Spirit chose to use a noun rather than a verb I know that the authorized version says zealous but it is a noun we are zealots he calls us zealots in the same sense that he calls us believers but we don't always believe or he calls us saints but we may not realize that we are righteous, that we stand before him righteous, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. God calls us zealots of his good works. Practically, we are told to set our affection on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father, meaning all authority has been given to Christ. So in verse 15, these are the things that we should speak. Now, I don't want to waste a lot of your time, but it's amazing to me that the emphasis is our giving heed to sound doctrine, and yet doctrine has all but become an ugly word among those professing to know Christ today. You know, just don't offend anybody. Just keep your message simple. And folks, I, I don't know what that, what that simple message means. I don't know what in the world that is. You know, 
Steve, don't don't get into doctrine. Just 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 a simple evangelistic message. And folks, I don't know what that means. These things speak and exhort. The word there, uh, parakaleo, call alongside, comfort, exhort. You know, convince might be the best translation there. These things exhort and comfort. The exhortation here is not one of guilt, but one of comfort. This is the same word from which we see the Holy Spirit as our comforter. The comforter is not going to load you full of guilt. You know, if you walk out of any, ch any, any church service, come away from watching any video, listen to, listening to any Bible teacher, feeling guilty, it's my personal opinion that the Holy Spirit has not spoken to you, but your own flesh has. The idea of this exhortation is one of comfort. Our lives are hidden in Christ with God. And convinced is the word that, that I, would, I would translate this. These are all present actives. These are the things that the Holy Spirit is commanding Titus. And of course, since the Word of God is profitable to us, you know, what should be the center of our conversation? What should be the, the curriculum that we teach? It's the Word of God and the finished work of Christ. And folks, you can't do that without doctrine. These are the things that we should speak. Let no man despise thee. You know, we, we read those words, and, and so, you know, what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to take a gun and shoot them, you know, if anybody despises us? You know, I mean, that can't be the idea of the verse. Should we engage in a, in a, in a brawl with these people, you know, so that they don't despise us? Obvi obviously, that's not the meaning of the verse. So in this context, it must mean that if we are centered in doctrine, if we are centered in biblical truth, then no one can reason around us, and that's the word. That's the meaning of the word despise. Let no one reason around you. We convince them with doctrine, but we don't engage them in some kind of battle over words or, or use human logic or, or human reasoning in order to just win an argument. We don't even use a doctrine to try to uh, just for the sake of winning an argument. It's, it's not a contest. We speak the truth in love. You folks don't have to agree with me. If, if we are centered in doctrine, no one can reason around us. So let no man despise thee. So, you know, feel free to disagree with me all you want. Because if I'm teaching sound doctrine, you're not going to despise despise me no matter how much that you are in disagreement. That's how I read that. We are to use the Word of God as our basis for, for, for reasoning. I believe that we are to be critical but not unloving. And sometimes that's hard for people to see through. Let no man despise you. Let no man reason around you. And I'm going to suggest that that can't happen if we are consistent with scripture. Titus is told that if he sticks to the truth of God's word, he can't be reasoned around. And so we begin chapter three, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers. Now, if we went back to chapter two, bearing in mind that there weren't any chapters there when this was written, those were, those were added as a convenience. So you'd know about where I'm at. we see that it flows over from Christ having redeemed us, a precious people unto himself, that he purified us, made us zealots for his good works, that we are to speak these things, comfort, convince, uh, reprove, rebuke with all authority, and let no man despise you, let no man reason around you, and then... Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities. And folks, the thing that you ought to consider here is the thing that you ought to ask, the question you ought to ask is, are these 
principalities and these powers, are they ecclesiastical or civil principalities and powers of, of, of governmental uh, authorities and so on and so forth? That's a present tense. Constantly be reminding them to be subject to principalities, powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. Constantly be reminding them to arrange themselves in an orderly fashion beneath the constituted authorities. It says principalities and powers. And uh, actually there's no conjunction and the word and's not there. It, it's an interesting grammatical structure and I take that structure to mean duly constituted authorities. Surely we as Christians should arrange ourselves in an orderly fashion beneath the authorities, the civil authorities, as well as the church authorities, both ecclesiastical and civil. The word obey, the word subject there is hupotasso. It's a combination of python, the Greek word to persuade, constrict, persuade, and the Greek word arche, that you ought to be persuaded by the duly constituted authority. And I, folks, along with many others, many others, am absolutely persuaded God sets up over the nations whomsoever he will. Even the worst of men, he's always done that. Folks, he's always done that. We know from our study of God's Word that government is duly constituted by God. He gave it. And, and no matter what government you might point to, the worst in the world, I am convinced it's better than anarchy. Now here's where I'm going to probably lose a lot of my Second Amendment friends. There are people out here who call... There are people, folks, who call themselves Christians who don't want to hear about what they don't they 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 would not want to hear what I'm fixing to say. This can be a tough pill to swallow. I've had many a debate with a friend of mine who who prefers anarchy to a police state. And folks, I recognize that is a terrible debate. But if the chips were down and I didn't have any other choice, I'd take the police state long before I'd give in to anarchy. Now let me explain why, okay? At least hear me out. At least give me the opportunity to explain why. Let's look at the context. Now what have we been looking at? We're dealing with God's Word here, folks, and we do not, we do not want to handle His Word deceitfully. The very thing people don't want to hear today, my, Doctrine. We, we, we've been proclaiming doctrine. We've been looking at doctrine. The emphasis is on doctrine. O Timothy, give heed to doctrine. And here in Titus, sound, healthy teaching. Sound doctrine. It's, it's the very thing that people don't want to hear. My Bible says, Timothy, take heed to doctrine, for in so doing thou shalt deliver both yourself and them that hear thee. And believe me, folks, that when the chips are down, the thing that will be your strength, the thing that will be my strength, the thing that will be your strength is your understanding of the truth of God's Word, of His sovereign majesty and power, that He is in control. Bottom line, that He's in control. We've seen a chapter on teaching doctrine, speaking truth to old men and, and to old women and to young women and to young men and to servants. 
you know, covering every every classification of the human experience, the human element. And when we finish that discussion of doctrine, it closes with a grand declaration that the Lord Jesus Christ, God Almighty, became our kinsman redeemer and giving himself in our place. Not, not some defeated God who came and tried to save all men, but you know, he didn't do too well. He got he got ten or twenty or or thirty percent of them, but most of them, you know, he wasn't able to get. You know, poor God. We ended the chapter with a marvelous note of victory that it was the Lord Jesus Christ Himself who died in our place. He didn't die for me. He died in my place. Big difference. He died instead of me, not for me. Therefore, I cannot die. And when we ended that chapter, we were told, if you stick to this truth, nobody can talk around you. No one can argue around you. And what is the result of that doctrine? What is the result of that? Be constantly reminding themselves to to orderly arrange themselves beneath the duly constituted authority, and I believe that authority to be in the church as well as the government. I thank God that I'm allowed to live in a country where there's freedom. And I've seen our, our freedoms be chipped away at here, even in the United States. Have you ever stopped, folks, to think about Daniel? He was a subject of the king of Israel, but he was taken captive, and he became obedient to the king of Babylon, an idolatrous, wicked uh, individual, to be sure. And yet he became such a good subject, arranging himself orderly beneath him, where that he became one appointed to a high place in the government, and that government fell to the Medes and the Persians. And what do we see? We find that once again, he, Daniel's faithful. He's faithfully and, and honorably serving that government. And I'm sure that many read Daniel and say, you know, well, no way, man. I would have, I, I, I'd head the underground. Daniel was no traitor, folks. I see in Daniel a submission to the mighty hand of God. That's what I see. I see the same in Joseph. Joseph, who made no attempt to escape from the land of, of Egypt, confidently believing that God had placed him there, he arranged himself in an orderly fashion under the powers that be, just what our text is saying here, and, and he served them well. I think it's, it's, it's hard, it's difficult for Christians, particularly Christians raised in a free country, to understand the implications of what God is saying. You know, many of our viewers here on this channel, they're not in the United States. Some, in fact, are in Iran and, and other oppressive nations. Look at the Lord Jesus Christ in His earthly walk. What better example? I don't know of a better example that I can give you of Him Himself, God Almighty, who engineered no movements to overthrow a wicked and a corrupt government. He was submissive to the will of the Father to obey magistrates. The, our text says, Be persuaded by magistrates to be ready, eager to every good work. The word good here is agathos, every beautiful work, every work which is pure and good. I believe that is there because the old man is one who is never ready to a good work. You know, it might look good on the surface. It may be a whitewashed tomb, you know, as, as our Lord declared, but inside it's full of dead men's bones. The, the old man works only evil ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man. That is, it should not be our purpose to, to underline or, or to destroy uh, someone's character or to verify, you know, uh, 
or you know, to false witness against him. Particularly, I believe that this to be applicable in the ecclesiastical realm. And that's where we live. And we're quick to judge one another. When I look at any other Christian, I always try to make it my, my first thought. You know, I don't know what God's doing in their life. I don't know where they are at this time in their experience. You know, there were times where I looked at the, the human author of this epistle and, and I concluded that, you know, he was hellbound. But God wasn't, obviously God wasn't through with Paul yet. And God isn't through with you. And God isn't through with me. But I know a God who declares being confident, being absolutely confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Do you folks, do you suppose he will? He began it. He'll finish it. Whatever God does, He does completely. We're told that in Ecclesiastes. I know that God will perfect that which concerns His own. Speak evil of no man. Do not be a brawler. The word there is, is contentious. Don't be contentious, but gentle. And and I'm not sure you want that translated, particularly in the in the system that I see operating today in our country. If you are contentious, you are testifying in your action, folks, that God is not sovereign, and that there is there's some area where God is not operating correctly, and so you insist on your own rights. And now I've, I've probably lost every last viewer that 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 you know every proud American patriot here. But, and folks, I adore the Second Amendment. I love this country. I adore the Second Amendment. Um, I'm really big on human rights. Yet, I, folks, I have to stick with what the text is teaching us. Live in such a way, peaceful, gentle, showing all meekness or humility. The word meekness, both in the Greek and in the Hebrew, does not carry with it the idea that most of us see in the word meekness. What the word means is absolutely trusting, absolutely trusting God. We see in the word meek someone who puts up with things that he shouldn't put up with. That's not the idea here. This word, prahutes, carries with it the, the, the idea that God is in control. Now, that's a real problem for most Christians. It so rubs against us, folks. Listen, what area in your life is God out of control? We recognize that our God is both the author and the finisher of our faith, that, that he who began a good work in you will complete it till the day of Christ Jesus, that he knows the way that we take and when he's tested us will come forth as gold. We, we, we know that he lights our candle, that he bottles our tears, that he preserves my steps, he guides and directs me, he directs my path, that he perfects that which concerns me. And we can, I, we can go on and on and on with all of that. And the more that I understand that, the more I understand that, the more I can settle into the fact that there is absolutely no, none, zero justification for my fighting against God. He always has my best in mind. That's what I see in the idea of meekness. Christ told Pilate that he would have no power over him unless it had been given to him from above. Is that not true of every area of activity in your life. No employer would have any power over you unless it had been given him from above. Isn't that true? Or, or have, I, have I extracted too much, really, from what Christ said? I don't think I have. I believe the reason the Holy Spirit recorded the words is not, not for Christ and not because Pilate needed to hear him, because he did hear him. 
but that I needed to hear those words. And you needed to hear these words. That was true even in the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is in control. Acts chapter 4, we all know the verse, Him being delivered by the determinate forward nation of God, ye by wicked hands have taken and slain. Nothing could have been changed. God was in control. That's what the idea of meekness means. Showing meekness unto all men, trusting in God. Those of you who know me, who have followed this ministry, know that I have it, you know, I, it's, it's almost like it's plastered on, on the, the front of my forehead, that the Lord is in control of my life. He's in the con control of this ministry. He's in control of the number of followers. He's in control of the number of views that this channel receives. It, he's in control of the number of subscribers. And I make no bones about telling you people that you don't have to agree with me on anything. In fact, you probably shouldn't. That the Holy Spirit's our teacher, that the Lord's in control. The Lord will direct you in this or that. That whatever the trial or, diff, or, or trouble, tribulation, the difficulty you're going through, it's going to come out however the Lord wants it. That's the kind of meekness I see. Or that's the meaning I see in this word. If the Lord wants this ministry to, to cease, my worrying about it won't change anything. My effort won't change that. If God has decreed something be, there's nothing in the world I can do to stop it. I believe the context is square in the center of the finished work of Jesus Christ in redemption in which He was sovereign. That sovereign aspect of his redeeming us where God was sovereign not man but where God was sovereign carries over into the third chapter here where that we're looking we, we are forced to look at we are forced to acknowledge the fact folks that God is sovereign in our lives when it comes to being subject to the authorities that's what I'm saying that's the flow over from chapter 2 to chapter 3 that's what I see Put them in mind to be subject. The word subject is hupotasso, which means to arrange oneself in an orderly manner beneath. Arrange oneself in an orderly manner underneath something. A husband, a, a business, a boss, a governmental authority, an ecclesiastical authority. And folks, if, if doctrinal error precedes moral error. Listen to me. Because it does. Doctrinal error precedes moral error. Well, then the, then the reverse of that must be true. Doctrinal truth must precede godly Christian behavior. There, therefore, I've got to conclude that the first application here is to the church. Though it doesn't end there. Okay? Okay. I'm not going to I'm not going to even come I don't want to step anywhere near to suggesting that that's the only application here is is ecclesiastical. I believe it's both. But but in looking at the context, I don't think that we can ignore the fa the the reality of the ecclesiastical authority here. So Sound biblical doctrine will determine how we approach the human responsibility seen here in chapter 3, verse 1. I've always believed that we are to always take serious note of the context. And though we've moved into chapter 3, I don't believe that the Holy Spirit has changed His direction of thought, of thought from the end of chapter 2, even though he's moved into the area of human responsibility. Kind of like, well, I'm, I'm done with chapter 2. You know, you know, I said what I meant to say there, and now I'm going to go into chapter 3, and now it, it's, I'm going to open up a whole different you know, subject here that's not related to what we read back in chapter 2. Folks, I, that's not the way I study. I can't study that way. That, that's just not what I'm seeing in the text. There were no original chapter divisions. 
No chapter divisions in the original manuscripts. We just have chapter divisions and verse numbers and all that, so we don't get lost. And we kind of know where we're at as we're going through this book. The Greek says, put them in mind. That is, their frame of mind ought to be one that arranges themselves in an orderly manner beneath duly constituted authority. What it means is duly constituted authorities. And those duly constituted authorities are everything above us. Everything. Particularly, especially in relation to the spiritual aspect of our lives. The church, God, angels, elders, pastors, mayors, game wardens, you know, law enforcement, governors, the National Guard, you know, the president of the nation, the king of the country, you know, you, and you need to decide in the context whether it's one or all of those. I think it's all. I think it's all with the church first and foremost in mind because of the context. The word obey there is an interesting combination of two Greek words. and only occur, occurs here and in Acts. Pytho is a word that means to be persuaded by. And arche is the highest level of the first. You know, the same word that's used for principalities, to be ready to every good work. This is agathos. And I believe that these are, are works which are fitting in the respect of of Christian responsibility in view of the good works that we saw in chapter 2, verse 14, which I believe is Christ's finished work. I don't believe that we can separate His finished work from human responsibility since His works are those works that He prepared beforehand that we're to walk in. You know, I see something extraordinary in the example of Jesus and Pilate. What I see in his subjection is death to self in order that others might live. Folks, listen. Please listen to me. Paul said, death works in me, but life in you. We know Christ was that living seed that was planted, that went into the cold, dark, damp earth and died. And as a result, through crucifixion, that, that through, through death, it brought forth, his death brought forth fruit of its own kind. And scripture has much to say about the fact that we have died and our life is hidden with Christ in God. I don't see how that we can possibly straddle the fence on this. To, to reject those authorities whom God has established for our good is, in my opinion, to reject the very cross of Christ that crucifies self. Because it's on that same cross that we were crucified with Christ. I guess I'm trying to get you to see the similarity in how Jesus, his mind was when he stood before Pilate, knowing and saying to Pilate what he did. And the very verse that we're looking at here, verse 1 of chapter 3. And how that we are to be subject to the authorities. Why? Because God is supremely sovereign. He is over every single minute detail of your life, every aspect of your life. There is nothing that He is not in control of. Nothing. He doesn't allow anything to touch your life except it be for your ultimate good. No, He only touches us in love, folks. And all he asks is that we trust him. In fact, I believe that's what he desires the most, is that we trust in him. Look, I love you all. I truly do. I hope you, all of you are being safe out there. I uh, am praying for you all constantly. I ask for your continued prayers for this ministry. I want to thank you for all of your messages, all of your prayers, all of your support. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.